Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have a question here. How do you come out of a mindset that you are not worthy of God's love after all sin you have committed? Uh, it's easy to know God loves everyone all the same, but how do we realize it? Uh, you know, to give a brief to the point answer, I would say you need to come to a point where you say God says it, I believe it, that settles it. Because that is one of the grandest declarations of the Bible that God loves you and has an everlasting plan for you. And the Bible uses so many rich analogies uh, to describe God's love uh, in a poetic way. Uh, you, Bible wraps this theology around so many memorable word pictures. Uh, in one point in the book of Ephesians, it talks about how high, how low, how wide. And, you know, the, the Bible runs out of vocabulary, uh, you know, talking, trying to describe how much God loves us. So the Bible says it, I believe, I believe it, that settles it. Sometimes it may not change you so much emotionally, but when you keep believing it and when you believe it from the heart, you know, uh, how do you believe something from the heart? Uh, it starts to impact the way you live. Uh, you see, when you, if I'm standing in the middle of a railway track and I look at a speeding train, uh, if and I believe that train is coming at me at 200 kilometers per hour, I will act on that belief by getting out of the railway track. The same is true about God's love. If I, the Bible says God loves me and he loves me crazy and he loves me with an everlasting love as the book of Jeremiah says and as he, and the Bible says he's got a grand plan for us. If all of that is true, uh, you know, that will change my life. Then I don't start living for my own lusts I don't live for my own my own dreams, but I start to uh, see things from through his eyes, and I want to please him through every action. Uh, so this is a brief response. I just want to make sure that I answer every question, at least the three we have here, and in case we have more as well. How do I differentiate happiness from God and happiness from the world? Uh, the Bible talks about this uh, in the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 11, uh, verse 25. Uh, the Bible says, uh, sin has pleasure. A world, uh, uh, when you say happiness from the world, happiness from sinful pleasures the world offers. So sin has pleasure, but those pleasures are passing pleasure. Passing pleasures, temporary pleasures. Uh, they're there for the moment and they're not there. I, we can understand it uh, very graphically from the, from the story in the Old Testament when Abnon raped Tamar. Now, till that point in time, he wanted to see, you know, he was obsessed with Tamar. He wanted to see her naked and have sex with her. But the moment he got to do that, those two things, there was an emptiness that he went through, which is evident by his action. Uh, we read that story in 2 Samuel chapter 13. He asked her to get up and get lost. I mean, uh, obviously she had the question. This was something that he was longing to do so with a, such an enormous desire. But when he had that pleasure, the balloon just burst. And he asked her to get up and get lost. So that's worldly pleasure. Uh, as one preacher brilliantly put it, you never find in sin what you entered sin to find. You never find in sin what you entered sin to find. You, there's always a disappointment. Uh, but as Proverbs 16, 11 says, there are eternal pleasures at his right hand. So, which means your happiness doesn't come with happenings. Uh, I've been through uh, romantic rejections before marriage. And I've been a believer from the age 11. I had my ups and downs. So, I've been through romantic rejections uh, growing up before I met my wife. Uh, I've been through a US visa rejection. I've been in a stage in my life when I cleared all rounds where my ability was measured, but just the HR round where that management had to take the decision whether they wanted me to be there in the company or not. I, I cleared every round, I reached the last round of Google, but got knocked out in the last round. I've been in all those stages, but none of those events happening around me impacted my the joy I have with Jesus. So Jesus gives you a happiness which doesn't depend on happenings. That's the big difference. Okay, uh, my brief response to that question. And then one more question we have. If 
Uh, nice handwriting. Thank you. Uh, beautiful. Okay. <laughs> uh, if Jesus is the only way to heaven, then what about those who lived before him and those who didn't hear about the gospel? Uh, the Bible gives the answer for that. Uh, because if you read the gospels carefully, uh, Jesus says, Isaiah saw me. Excuse me, Jesus. When did Isaiah see you? You know, all the Old Testament saints, they looked forward to Jesus. And that's how they got saved. Okay, their belief in the coming Messiah is what this what saved them. It's still by faith. It is not by following the law. Uh, some hyper grace uh, cultic pastors will like to tell you Old Testament is about law, New Testament is about grace. The Bible is grace from the first page to the last page. Abraham believed God, Genesis 15, 6, and it was credited to him as righteousness. So, uh, throughout the Bible, you know, in the Old Testament, Jesus is in shadow. They, they looked forward to the coming of Jesus and they were saved. And in the New Testament, we, we, we look back and it makes sense because Jesus is 100% human, 100% God. Uh, he's infinite. So, he can die for my sin. He can die for my daughter's sin. And down the line, my daughter will get married. God um, uh, I believe God will bless her with children. Uh, so Jesus has died, already died for the sins of my grandchildren because he is God and he is beyond time. And his sacrifice has a timeless effect. Uh, of course, this is a big subject. So that's, and do they go to hell by default? Uh, you know, defining who goes to hell, who doesn't go to hell, that's not frankly our job. Uh, that's the job that Jesus has and you read about that in Revelation chapter 20 there's a great white throne judgment and then the last verse of Revelation 20 the Bible says though who goes to hell the names are not written in the Lamb's book of life again underlining the teaching in the entire Bible the way you go to heaven is by putting your trust in the Lamb who's the Lamb the one who died for you on the cross so there is no crossless salvation presented in the Bible. So you all of us need to repent from sin and come to Jesus and receive his forgiveness from the at the cross. And then we get to heaven. Uh, who goes to heaven or hell? Uh, that Jesus will decide on the great white throne judgment. Our job is to proclaim what the Bible clearly teaches as the only way to heaven. Uh, our job is not to go, on, go and say this person went to hell, that person went to hell. Only one person... The Bible clearly says is going to hell or has gone to hell and there is Judas. Apart from that, we must refrain. Even the worst backslidden preacher, if he had a, that second before he died, he, he repented. And like, it, like the dying thief said, you know, he just had to look at Jesus with a repentant heart. He had a repentant heart, that's all. Uh, he didn't have even time for a confession prayer, a repentant heart. But the other fellow was mocking Jesus. But this fellow had a repentant heart. And he looked at Jesus. Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. So the worst sinner with a repentant heart at that moment can come to heaven. So it's in that sense very easy to come to heaven. You need a repentant heart. And then of course you live in this world. Uh, you have two requirements to go to heaven. Forgiveness and holiness. Without holiness no one will see God. But holiness is also by grace. Not by your self-effort. Holiness is by falling in... Holiness happens when you keep falling in love with Jesus with a greater intensity. All right, uh, that's my brief response. Okay, uh, what about those who lived in India before Thomas came and preached the gospel? Okay, the destiny of those who died without uh, uh, knowing of Jesus, it's, it was in fact, I wrote a 40-page paper on that uh, in my end of final year as a thesis. Uh, lots of answers have been given by different theologians but I think there's a clue in Romans chapter 1 you read that and the Bible uses a phrase in Romans chapter 1 where it says they have no excuse uh, the people who have not heard of Jesus have no excuse because if they have responded to the general revelation of God uh, from the skies uh, and God's voice comes to us from the beautiful skies the clouds uh, from the beautiful plants with all those uh, splendid colors. They all tell us there's a creator. And when we see the storm and when we see the uh, the ocean, we understand he's a mighty God. So God speaks to us from through through general things like the sky and the stars. And, uh, Psalm 19 talks about it. 
So if you respond to it, if you respond to that light, you will go to a place called special revelation. And that one fellow did that. You know what his name is? We read about him in Acts, Cornelius. He was constantly responding to general revelation and God sent him a missionary, Peter. So if people have responded to general revelation, I believe, and there, are, there are people who disagree with me, God will lead them to the special revelation. So I believe people in India, before Thomas came, if they have responded to general revelation, God would have, you know, we don't have a complete history of the church ever. You know, we only have a sporadic history of the church. If they have pursued passionately the truth, they, God would have opened some way for them to hear the gospel. That is what I believe. Uh, uh, though uh, I would also like to quote from a verse from the book of Genesis, will the judge of the earth not do right? So on the final day of judgment, uh, I believe Jesus will judge all these things and he will make a fair call. Uh, we can be rest assured that he will not be unfair. So, But what we know from the Bible, we see it with conviction. We'd say it, we'd say it with passion. What the Bible is not clear, we don't go on making a big doctrine about it. By doctrine about it, by meaning, we can't go on confidently saying that people who have died before Thomas came will go to heaven. The Bible doesn't clearly say that. So what the Bible doesn't clearly say, let's also not clearly say. Because that is uh, that is responsible Bible interpretation. Do we have more questions? Yeah. Okay, you, you're Now, handling romantic relationship, there's a verse in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 46, 10, if I'm not wrong. Uh, it's there definitely in Isaiah, uh, where the Bible says, the Lord knows the end from the beginning. So if the Lord has been speaking to me, saying that this is not the girl you have to marry, and he's been trying to say that to me, but I don't hear. The obvious thing he'll do is he'll harden the girl's heart and make her say no to me. Because he knows the kind of life I live with that girl down the down the line because he knows the end from the beginning he knows he's god there's nothing he does not know so if i'm not going to if i'm going to be stubborn and you know god loves me so much that he will make he will make the girl's heart stubborn and she'll say no to me so that i'll learn to move on and i should move on uh, and uh, because at the end of the day, there's only one person's love which it is ultimately of importance to me, and that is God. And He's with me. I need to move on. Uh, and down the line, you know, I will meet my life partner. So I, I, I forget what is behind and press on uh, forward, as Paul says in Philippians. So that's that's one way I uh, I, I learn to move forward. Uh, uh, but though, you know, I. I, I, I have shared my story of romantic rejection. It's on YouTube. and uh, But then when I share that with my wife, she always uh, says, she escaped. I got caught. And then she's, and she smiles. Okay. Well, that's another story. Okay. <laughs> there is one question which came from um, Sharon. Uh, she said, is it all right to have relationships that are not necessarily godly? Mm -hmm. For example, a friendship with someone who doesn't know Christ. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can have a friendship with a person uh, who doesn't know Christ, but I will be appalled if you didn't even try to share the gospel and and you try to share the gospel, the uniqueness of Jesus will come. So the person has to take a call whether Jesus is unique, uh, you know, that will bring him to a point of disturbance. So uh, you can still be friends. The person can still reject Jesus. You can still be friends. But whatever be the nature of those that friendship the gospel has to come 
Because Paul says, oh, unto me if I don't preach the gospel. It's, that's something that uh, we, need to, uh, uh, we need to constantly do. So we cannot have a relationship with anyone where the gospel is not uh, going to be the, our conversation one time or the other. Uh, and if we have such friendships, we need to make sure that we bring in the gospel soon. And chances are, when you bring in the gospel, that person will back off and uh, may not be that close to you down the line. So that, that, that will be my brief response. But I have a question. Yes. So if, you, uh, so if you're having friends, you know, uh, who've been friendly for a very long time, right? Uh, they might not be Christians, they might not be believers. Uh, and at some point, uh, maybe not at the start of the friendship, I'm saying like maybe childhood friends or something, you grow up with them and at one point you realize that you haven't really taken the effort to you know, tell them about God. Uh, but you've been good friends until late and now you don't know how to initiate that conversation. How would you, uh, what would be the, of course you've got to pray about it and you know, but still uh, if you keep finding it's difficult to start that conversation because you know it's going to be uh, really out of the blue because of the friendship that you've had for such a long time and you never spoke about it in all these years. So how would you? Yes, uh, it's a good question. Uh, you know, Paul was in such a setting in Athens. Uh, so how he started off the gospel is he started the gospel presentation with what he saw in their world. He saw an idol which said to an unknown God. So that began, that that what he saw began became a starting point. And then what he read, not from the Bible, but from the secular writers, uh, so one of their own poets, like Vairamuthu maybe, you know, to put, as I, I quoted from Vairamuthu in my uh, last message, uh, one of their secular poets wrote something. Uh, one of your own poets say, we are the offspring of God. So, and then he says, we are God created, God has a plan for us. And then, so we need to, whatever our friends say, which we, uh, we listen, we listen with concentration, then we just have to clear our throat, ask God grace and jump in and connect that. It will f see, seem awkward the first time, the, seem awkward the second time and then you'll find out that evangelism becomes a way of life. And that's what was true of the early church. The early church was gossiping the gospel. And that is why people became believers every passing day in the early church. Uh, and even uh, uh, for me to start conversations with uh, leave alone with friends, it's in fact I would say a little more easy because uh, your friends, if you're following the Jesus way, they already have seen that you take some tough stands. Uh, they, you don't uh, swear, you don't abuse, you don't tell lies, uh, you don't lose your cool that easily. So they, if they see that. If you're living the gospel, they will see that your life is different. Uh, for example, when I was in uh, in my ragging period, when everybody was ra getting ragged, I still had the uh, cheerful countenance. And one of my roommates literally asked me, how are you able to be cheerful and cool when we are all having the, uh, uh, the, the test of our life? Then that was an opportunity for me to bring in Jesus. So we think to bring in Jesus is inappropriate. That thinking we need to set aside and bring in Jesus. And then the second time becomes more easier than the first and then and so on and so forth. So the Bible is not just talking about giving the gospel to your best friends, even to your one time acquaintances over travel, you know, that's something that should be our all consuming passion. That's why Jesus said, "We are, I have called you to be fishers of men. That's our lifetime, that's our life calling to be fishers of men to share the gospel with everyone we bump into. Uh, the auto guys, the cab drivers, the food delivery agents who knock at our door, uh, the blanket guy who delivers grocery at our house, you know, keep a track, uh, you know, have a conversation. And once you, some, it looks very difficult from now, but uh, when, you, when you have not done it, but once you start doing it once, it's like a bad habit. It's like the first fag. It's like the first uh, peg which became a jug and then it became a mug. 
like you know the bad habits how they grow this good these things which are which we do in line with god's word will also grow with increasing passion